Welcome to our journey into the realm of differential geometry. In this video, we delve into the fabric of space itself, exploring its intricate structure through the lens of mathematical abstraction. Our exploration begins with the fundamental question, what is the nature of space? The evolution of geometry led to the discovery of non-Euclidean geometries where the parallel postulate no longer holds true. Here we encountered worlds where the sum of angles in the triangle can be greater or less than 180 degrees, challenging our basic intuition and expanding our understanding of space. So in this video, we will look into the evolution of non-Euclidean geometry and how it led to our modern understanding of the nature of space. My name is Shonak and you are watching this video on my channel Physics for Students. Welcome to this fresh video, Learning Differential Geometry. Well, first we will start whatever is written right on the thumbnail. What is the Euclidean and from here, how do we move into non-Euclidean geometry? Now, differential geometry is the application of calculus to the geometry of a space that is obviously curved. But if I ask you the question to understand space that is curved, we shall understand and try to understand what is and what is called a flat space. Now, we generally uh, inhabit in a natural world pervaded by curved objects. And if a child uh, makes us or asks us the meaning of the world, what is flat? we are most likely to answer it in terms which is called the absence of curvature. Or we can call a smooth surface which has got no hollows or bumps and so on. Nevertheless, the very earliest mathematicians seem to have drawn to the singular simplicity and uniformity of the flat plane and they were rewarded with the discovery of startling beauty and facts about geometric figures constructed within it. With the benefit of this enormous hindsight, some of these new facts can be characterized with the concept of the plane's flatness. Now, these geometers and uh, mathematicians, whom are we talking about? If you can guess with this kind of a half figure, then please do let me know in the comment box. But yes, what we are talking about is uh, this person, Pythagoras, and one of the earliest and most profound such facts can be found into Pythagoras' theorem, surely of the ancients uh, must have, uh, you know, uh, find it in a sensitive person, but must remain today that seemingly unalloyed facts about these numbers. So you, you, you can see what we learned in our school, day, school days, what is the uh, pictorial description of Pythagoras' theorem. So this 3 square plus 4 square equals to 5 square. I mean to say this is a, a you know, pictorial uh, description of the uh, meaning. Now, while Pythagoras himself lived in Greece around 500 BCE, the theorem bearing his name was actually discovered much, much, much earlier in various places around the world. For example, this Sanskrit shloka uh, from the Bodhyayana Sutras Kalpa Yajur Vedam actually speaks the same thing which Pythagoras spoke. So it is written that the rope stretched along the length of the diagonal of a rectangle makes an area which uh, the vertical and horizontal slided make together. So in a, in, a, in, in a sense, it is the same hypotenuse squared equal to base squared plus perpendicular squared. So this Sanskrit shlokas from the Yajur Vedam actually tells the same thing. So just wanted to cite an example that while before Pythagoras or during the time of Pythagoras, there has been numerous such examples stating the same Pythagoras' theorem. Now, the earliest known example uh, is recorded in the Babylonian clay tablet, which is called this figure, which is called the Plimpton 322, which existed around 300 and, uh, 1800 BCE, uh, which was unearthed, which is now in Iraq and which dates back around 1800 BC. So the tablet actually lists what is called Pythagorean triples, integers like a square plus b square equal to h square. Now some of these ancient examples are impressively large and it seems clear that they did not stumble upon them but rather possessed a very smooth mathematical process for generating solutions. For example, the fourth row of this tablet actually records something like this. 1350 double squared plus 1270 squared equals to 1851 squared. 
Now, the deeper knowledge that underlay these Anson results is actually not known. But to find the first evidence of the modern logical deductive approach to mathematics or uh, we can say geometry, we must jump 1200 years into the future of the clay tablet. And if you're really interested to know a little bit more about Pythagoras's life and times, here is a book I would recommend, Pythagoras, His Life and Teaching by Thomas Stanley, and you can definitely look into that. So we leap from where we actually left, that is from Pythagoras, we jump into 1,200 years into the future of the clay tablet and encounter this famous person, Thales of Miletus, who was ancient Greek pre-Socratic philosopher from Miletus in Ionia. Uh, Thales was one of the seven sages founding figures of ancient Greece and credited with the saying, Know thyself, which was inscribed on the temples of Apollo at Delphi. Now, he was the first philosopher in the Greek tradition, breaking from the prior use of mythology to explain the world and instead using natural philosophy. He is also credited for, is the one who first pioneered the idea of deducing new results from previously established ones. So, scholars believe that it was Thales of Miletus who first pioneered the idea of deducing new results from the earlier one. Now, uh, leaping forward again around 300 years uh, beyond Thales, we find one of the most perfect exemplars of the new approach of geometry, none other than Euclid's elements dating from 300 BCE. This work sought to bring order and clarity and rigor to geometry by deducing everything from just five simple axioms, the fifth and the last of which are dealt basically with parallel lines. So the scholars pursued endeavored what I have written to instill geometry and it was first deduced logically with a set of five fundamental axioms. Now, this is the uh, diagram which we all know about Euclid's parallel axioms and the axiom says that through any point small p, as you can see I have just highlighted over here, not on the line L, the capital L, there exists precisely one line capital P that is parallel to L. But you know the character of this axiom was, uh, I would say, more complex and less immediate than that of the first four. And the mathematician began a long, long struggle to dispense within its assumption, instead trying or seeking to show that it must be a logical consequence of the first four axioms. So there were tensions, there were attempts, there were you know, numerous attempts, <laughs> I would say, as centuries passed uh, in order to prove the parallel axioms and the number of the intensity of these efforts reached a crescendo in 1700s, but all of them <laughs> made with a failure. So many attempts were made to prove the parallel axiom. So uh, if I uh, take an example, for example, the uh, useful equivalent of the uh, axiom emerged, there exist similar triangles of different sizes, but the very first equivalent was already present in Euclid, and it is one that is still taught to every school child, the angles in a triangle add up to two right to right angles. So the explanation of these failures were continuing until the era or I would say the year 1830 emerged. And what happened in that year was that we find two great uh, mathematicians or we can say geometers, uh, Russian Nikolai Lobachkvesky and Janosch Boliai announced the discovery of an entirely new form of geometry which is now called hyperbolic geometry taking place in a new kind of a plane which is called hyperbolic plane. Now this hyperbolic plane, I mean to say M.C. Escher's uh, you know, right, uh, drawings and Roger Penrose also used a lot of structures on hyperbolic plane. It's a very you know, complex but a very interesting kind of a structure which uh, uh, happens, I'm not going to explain but this is a new kind of a geometry. Hyperbolic hyperbolic geometry which is taking plane on a hyperbolic plane and in this geometry uh, what happens is that the first four Euclidean axioms hold but the parallel axiom does not hold instead the following is true there are at least two parallel lines through that small p that do not meet at L now, uh, with the passage of time, the pioneers and the scholars explored the logical consequences of this axiom and by purely abstract reasoning, 
which were led to a host of fascinating results with a rich new geometry that was totally different from that of Euclid. And it was a divergent from the classical paradigm established by Euclid. So uh, many others uh, actually strive, but what we would take a note of this person, Giovanni Sakheri, uh, and uh, this person, Johann Heinrich Lambert, uh, and discovered some of the consequences of this axiom, but their aim in exploring this consequence had been to find what is called uh, a find a contradiction. So the intents of Sakheri's work was ostensibly to establish the validity of Euclid's by means of what is called reductio ad absurdum. Now, let me give you a quick example of what do I mean that uh, by that. Uh, say, for example, assume the statement that all dogs are cats. I mean, so let us assume. Now, the absurdity is that if all dogs are cats, then say, for example, Chiahua, which is undeniably a dog, would also be a cat. And the conclusion is, this leads to absurdity. We know Chiahua are not cats. Therefore, we draw a conclusion, our original statement, all dogs are cats, must be false. So, Sakhendi's, I would say, work in order to establish the validity was something like reductio ad absurdum. And as you can see here, uh, this was a, a, a book which was published, very famous, Euclid Freed, Freed of Every Law, where Sakari is primarily known for this, for his, I would say, the last publication in 1733, shortly before his death. But, you know, this uh, work actually uh, contains certain obscurity, and, but uh, it was later, you know, I have not mentioned here, but later it was uh, discovered by Eugenie Beltrami, and uh, but this work is considered as one of the forerunner or forerunner or one of the i would say pioneer in terms of establishment of what is called the non euclidean geometry so the works of sakheri and heinrich lambert is definitely uh, important but sakheri is this uh, work euclid freed of every law and you can see this written in the Italian, which I would not pronounce, otherwise it would be wrong. So this was the last work and the obscurity was later cleared up. So what do we see from here that Lobachkovsky and uh, Boliai richly deserve their fame for having been the first to recognize and fully embrace the idea that what they have discovered in an entirely new, consistent, non-Euclidean geometry. But this new geometry really meant and what it m might be useful for even what they could say. What I'm trying to mean by this is that really people could not understand the implication, the importance and the consequence of this non-Euclidean geometry. So the non-Euclidean geometry had discreetly infiltrated various mathematical domains over history concealed beneath the veil of convention. And it was not until this great French universalist mathematician Henri Poincaré, uh, commencing around 1882, not only unveiled its true essence, but also harnessed its formidable potential across a spectrum of fields, including complex analysis, differential equations, number theory, and topology. So this was first Poincaré who first understood the importance and he used this into various fields of mathematics. We come to the next important part of the discovery which led to the further formulations of geometry, which is called is a spherical geometry. Now, in order to construct a non-Euclidean geometry, as we have been watching this video, we understood that we must deny the fact the existence of unique parallel. So, the hyperbolic axiom assumes that two or more parallels, but there is one logical possibility. Uh, that is no parallels and this is what is the spherical I would say axiom it actually tells that there are no lines through P that small p that are parallel to the capital line L every line meets at L. So uh, what emerges from here is that there are two types of non-Euclidean geometry. The first one is the spherical geometry and it can be realized on the surface of this kind of a sphere or you can say it can be developed on the case of a unit sphere uh, which you may picture a kind of an earth or something. On this sphere uh, and, the, and the second one is obviously the hyperbolic geometry. Now on this sphere what should be if I ask you the question, which is a straight line connecting two points on the surface. I'm going to say, obviously, the straight line which is connecting a flat surface, you know, but what should be 
the uh, analog of a straight line connecting two points on the surface? The answer is quite simple and this is what we called is the great circle. So uh, it is actually known, it is no nothing new, the ants in mariners uh, knew that it is the shortest route. So we can draw, draw these two type of diagrams, which is called a great circle, such as the equator. And I have taken this equator just highlighted here, the capital L, which is uh, this line. Uh, with a plane passing through its center and we have chosen L to be the equator and it is clear from this figure it satisfied actually this axiom that every line I would say uh, this one this blue one that uh, every line through P small p meets uh, at uh, L in a pair of antipodal antipodal means diametrically opposite points so every line through P meets L in a pair of antipodal so in a plane, the shortest route obviously is also the straightest route. And in fact, the same is true on the sphere uh, in a precise way, which will be discussed later. So these are there, but there are other ways, remember, of constructing great circles of the earth that do not require thinking about planes passing through completely inaccessible center, etc. For example, let us imagine this one, a globe, and you find a map out of your great journey, and you're trying to, uh, I would say, tie a piece of knot or a string on London and pulling the string slightly, tightly over the surface so that the other end on New York, so the taut string, as you can see, has automatically found the shortest straight path, and which is called the great circle, and another is the room line. And the shorter the, the two arcs uh, into which the great circle through this two cities divided by those uh, cities. So, uh, uh, in a word, we can say that um, uh, uh, the, the, the line that it divides is the shortest and the straightest route. I would say the shorter that of the two arcs into which the great circle through the two cities is divided uh, in between those two cities. So uh, what we see can that with the analog of two straight lines now can we construct a new kind of a geometry? Yes, we can do as you can see in this figure within the sphere of the surface. For example, given three points, one is the North Pole, another is the triangle, another is the equator. We can connect them together with a great circle and we can obtain a triangle. Now hold on, whether the angles of the triangle, etc. Uh, will be equal to 180 degrees, how differential geometry uh, uh, behaves onto that, we will come to that plot later. But if this you, question is that if this non-Euclidean spherical geometry was already known by ancient mariners who can navigate the ocean or by the astronomers who can map the spherical night sky, a question is that what is so great, what is so shocking, what is so revealing about this new non-Euclidean geometry found by Lobachevsky and Bolyai? So the answer is that this spherical geometry was merely considered to be inherited from the Euclidean geometry of the three-dimensional space in which the sphere resides. I repeat that it was merely considered that it is to be inherited from the Euclidean geometry of the three-dimensional space in which the sphere resides. No thought was given in those times to the sphere's internal two-dimensional geometry. Remember, it was not, uh, I want to say, people really didn't thought or the, uh, uh, the mathematical maturity was not there that the sphere's internal two-dimensional geometry as representing an alternative to Euclid's plane. So it not only did it violate Euclid's fifth axiom, it also violated a much more basic one, that is Euclid's first axiom, which tells that we can always draw a unique straight line connecting two points for this fails when the points again are antipodal. So uh, from here we emerged into what we call it is called a new kind of a, a uh, you know spherical geometry and uh, uh, I would come back next to this part that the hyperbolic geometry of Lobachevsky and uh, I would say uh, uh, Bolyai was much more serious. Serious in the sense that it actually led to a uh, uh, much more serious affront in terms of Euclidean geometry, containing familial lines of finite length. And it was during this time that the young 21-year-old Janus Bolyai con confidently and exuberantly uh, wrote to his father that, my father, from nothing I have created an entirely new world. Now, this actually calls for a tragic uh, story, which would be coming up into the next part of the video 
a tragic story but the story of a profound genius and how it led to the revelation of yet another a uh, great personality and we see a different perspective of that personality coming up in the next part of the video a tragedy now janos boliai or johan boliai was a hungarian mathematician who developed what is called absolute geometry which means a geometry that includes both euclidean geometry and hyperbolic geometry now boliai was born in the town of kolozvar uh, which is a grand municipality of transylvania and he was the fun of susan benko and another great mathematician farkas boliai now the elder boliai Uh, uh, had hopes that his son would go to Gottingen to study with his friend Karl Friedrich Gauss. However, the family could not attend to send the youngster to a prestigious university, and the least bad of the option was that Janos would study in a military engineering academy of engineering at Vienna. Now, by the age of thirteen, he had mastered calculus and other forms of analytical mechanics, receiving instruction from his father. Now Boliai got so much obsessed with Euclid's parallel postulate that his father in order to save a kind of his career for his son wrote this You must not attempt this approach to parallels I know the way to the very end I have traversed this bottomless night which extinguished all light and joy in my life I entreat you leave the science of parallels alone and learn from my example However Janosch however persisted in his quest and eventually came to the conclusion that the postulate is independent of the other axioms of geometry and that different consistent geometries can be constructed of its negation in 1823 and on the 3rd of november 1823 a young jubilate janos wrote to his father i have discovered such wonderful things that i was amazed out of nothing i have created a strange new universe now what he meant by this new world was basically the idea of this hyperbolic geometry and this was outlined in an appendix to the book called tentamen which was written by farkas boliai now you see that his father and this is actually the uh, you know the manuscript so here you can see that it is appendix scientium spati absolute verum exib exhibens which means appendix explaining the absolute a uh, true science of space and this classic essay of 24 pages which just contains janosch systems of non euclidean geometry is the only work of his uh, which is published during his lifetime now uh, his father uh, actually was a very close friend of the prince of mathematics karl friedrich gauss but remember farkas was actually uh, not very convinced about boliai's work so janos i mean to say his father uh, janos showed him a manuscript that contained his theory of absolute space and because he was not convinced farkas boliai could not accept the geometry of his son mainly because it depend on an arbitrary constant but he finally decided to send it to his uh, son's manuscript to the prince of mathematics that is karl gauss and here try strikes the tragedy a little bit kind word in public from gauss the first famous mathematician would have assured a better and a brighter career for this young mathematician janos boliai but instead what happened gauss kept boliai's paper in suspense for 6 months and then uh, i would say he replied this now something about the work of your son you will probably be shocked for a moment when i begin by saying that i cannot praise it by i cannot but i cannot do anything else since to praise it would be to praise myself the whole content of the paper the path that your son has taken and the results to which he has been led agree almost everywhere with my own meditations which have occupied me in part for 30 to 35 years that means gauss was telling that this is nothing something new that boliai has done but it is his own credit and he has done it around 30 to 35 years ago now this was a terrible shock for young janos and he abandoned mathematics for the rest of his life later he criticized his father as he suspected that gauss has been 
secretly inform about his discovering which caused a rift between the father and the son's relation. He later bitterly complained about Gauss's attitude. Now, Bollier's, uh, you know, essay went unnoticed by other mathematicians and in 1848 discovered that uh, Lobachevsky had published an account which is virtually the same geometry in 1829. In addition to his work, Bollier developed a rigorous geometric concept of complex numbers as ordered of real pairs. Now, you might be wondering, I'm showing you a cartoon figure of a person which was not Bollier, but if you search Bollier's a face around internet and encyclopedia you will come across lot of photographs but these are not right i've got a paper which i will put up later in a video which has got a thorough research and it tells that no original portrait of bali i survives and the picture that appears in many encyclopedias and on a hungarian postage stamp is not considered to be uh, authentic this is the only one i'm so sorry this is the only bust of bali i uh, which is considered to be authentic. So, uh, Bollier's essay went unnoticed and as you can see here, this is the only manuscript that survived. So, uh, I would say the appendix set up a series of mathematical proposals whose implications would blossom into the new field of non-Euclidean geometry. Now, I would definitely not end the video with a tragic event, but there is something which is very happy and an insightful event which happened on the other part of the world. And I would like to end the video with that kind of a positive optimism. What happened when Leonard Euler uh, actually found, I would say, a letter from Joseph Louis Lagrange. Remember, Lagrange was around just 19 years old and he happily wrote to Euler about the discoveries of calculus of variations. Don't think me wrong, Leonard Euler did not conceal his writing, did not say that he has discovered already, but he wrote this one. I deduced this myself, however, I decided to conceal this until you publish your results, since in no way do I want to take away from you any of the glory that you deserve. Wow, what a person, what a profound mathematician, what a genius he is that he actually has discovered, but he decided to hide hid his writing in order to help Joseph Louis Lagrange's writing come in front of the public, come in front of the world and so that he deserves the true glory. And if you're wondering from where did I found out this type of stories, you can read this book, Tales of Mathematician and Physicist by Simon Gintkin, and it contains a, a lot of this kind of a motivational tragic events which will make you think and think about mathematics and the evolution of mathematics. That's all for today's video. I thank you very much for watching this. If you like this video, please hit on the subscribe button and click on the bell icon to get all the notification from Physics for Students. You can write me over this email ID and don't forget to subscribe to my other channel, General Theory of Relativity, where I put on General Relativity Explained. You can follow me on my other uh, areas of networking, which is the Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter account. Physics for Students will be soon back with such lot of insight videos but till then i wish you all the best and may the good lord be with you